Hello, everyone. I'm Vin Ebenu at the Toms River Fire Center here with Chief Bob Sinnett of the Silverton Volunteer Fire Company, where they're conducting a fire training drill today, and a video of which you'll be able to see coming up in just a couple minutes. Uh, Chief, what are... What are some of the things that were going on with today's drill? What, what are some of the things that your crews were practicing? Today we went over fire suppression, fire rescue of a person trapped in a building, and also pumping and fire flows. So we did three separate evolutions combined into one. How do you, uh, what are some of the ways that you have to prepare for certain situations in, in, in these drills that could help you prepare for the real thing? Every situation is different, so it's hard to be prepared for everything. However, today we, we broke it down into VEIS, which is vent, enter, isolate, search. We're on the second floor with a ladder, and also fire suppression on the first floor with a handline. What are some of the communication methods that you practice in this drill that help for the real thing between what you have to relay over to your firefighters, what the, the firefighters on the inside of a building or a home have to relay to those on the outside? Well, basically, the, the fire department, when we get there, we do a 360 of the building. We do a complete walk around so we can see where the fire is, where might be potential victims are, where we have to go to work, and how quickly we have to go to work. And the additional apparatus coming in, they supply the water supply. So you, in the, the videos, you'll see that the fire trucks are supplying water to each other while the first two crews are doing fire suppression and the victim rescue. Now, what, what do you have to prepare f uh, based off of... Uh fires you guys have fought in the past, do, do those play a role in the drills with any complications that you've come across in the past? Do you throw those into drills to prepare for the next time it may happen? Yes, we do. And unfortunately, uh, you can never be prepared for the next situation 100%, but we try our best to come up with every different way to throw twists and curveballs. And today we put a victims inside the fire room, so when the crew went in to do fire suppression, they were met with two victims that are inside the building that had to do a rescue also. Now explain to me the hoses. I know you were talking to me a little bit about that before we got on camera about how the water gets into the house, into the building, between the fire trucks. How much water pressure, how much water has to go into putting out a fire? Every fire truck has different amounts of water on an average is 500 gallons, but then we'll use a 5 inch, five, five inch supply line to connect to the fire hydrant. And today we have an engine from Ocean Beach supplying an engine from Eastover with the hand lines coming off Eastover's engine. So the, the crews work together and the people might not be inside, our firefighters are not inside the building, but they're actually outside working together, talking to each other to get proper water flows and calculations. How does how do doing drills with other, other uh, departments help your department or other departments in the, in a situation where there's going to, at a fire, there's going to be multiple fire departments there, does it help to uh, figure out ways to work together at these drills and does it help for the real thing? Yes, and uh, every day is a challenge in the volunteer fire department because you're never going to have the same crew and the same people and the same amount of people on each truck. So it might be a Saturday, you'll get more people because people are home from work. A nighttime fire, you have more people. During the daytime, you call more companies and more resources, so you're going to have mutual aid stations working with you. So drills like this, we have four different stations up here today working with each other uh, to do radio communications and also people skills so we know how each other's skill levels are to work with each other. When you're responding to a fire and then when you arrive on the scene, uh, do you have to have a plan in place for what you're going to do first, or do you, is that something you guys develop when you arrive on the scene, depending on how bad the fire is at that point? Yeah, every call dictates what we're going to do. If it's a, a confirmed fire, where the dispatch center receives multiple 911 calls, we'll go right to a second alarm or third alarm or bring additional resources in and staging trucks just in case we do need them. So it's all based on the size of the fire, time of day, and occupancy. Are there certain situations where you can't go into a fire right away because it's too hot or too out of control? There could be. Uh, it could be a chemical plant. It could be a, uh, an unoccupied building. It's a risk versus benefit factor. So if it's an unoccupied building that you know that's unoccupied, uh, you're going to go a little bit uh, different uh, defensive tactics versus offensive tactics. What about going to a home fire where there's people still inside and they feel trapped? They're, they're not sure how to get out. How do you direct them out and, with, um, and of course, be safe with you, you going in yourselves? Well, that actually starts with fire prevention, and we have a fire prevention bureau that goes in with the fire companies of all our schools. So starting at the nursery school level, we try to teach students and kids how to interact with a fireman in full turnout gear because you're, you're wearing a mask, you're wearing a helmet, and it's going to be a dark environment. So, so we're trying to get the kids in elementary school level to understand what we look like so they're not hiding under a bed or hiding in a closet to make our jobs a lot easier. But that's all done by a case-by-case -case study, and we pull up to a house, if there's a fire in a certain area, that's when we start doing a window rescues or a first floor rescue, depending on where the fire is and where the occupants might be. When, when responding to a fire, when you're on the scene and trying to put it out, is are there certain things that you're able to detect through s sense of smell with 
how strong the fire might be or where the fire might be or uh, coming from? Yeah, that comes with training and education in our fire academy uh, to become a firefighter is about 280 hours, so it's just shy of 300 hours, and they go over fire uh, fire tactics and also what burns and how it burns, and you can colors of smoke, types of smoke. So it's all you learn the basics in the fire behavior actually in the fire school, and then as you get older and you're part of the fire service, you can get your your knowledge under your belt by by seeing fires and being part of it. When you're inside the home or a, or a business and there's something that doesn't look right or looks suspicious that that could possibly explode or could possibly fall and cause the fire to get worse. Uh, what are some of the ways you prepare for that, and what are some of the ways that firefighters would react to a situation like that? Do they have to leave right away, or do they have to try to move some things around? It's, it's again, every situation dictates a different type of situation, and we have built into our systems where if the roof is going to collapse or the building is going to get a lot worse than what it looks like when we first got there, we call an evacuation tone where the fire trucks on the outside blow their air horns and they come out. If a firefighter gets lost or, or is down or missing, they have a, a pass alarm, it's called. It's a safety alarm on their breathing pack where they can push the button, or if they fall down and go unconscious, then the, the alarm automatically goes off, and that trains our firefighters to go in and be able to look for another firefighter that's down based on the sound. So there's all different ways of... of for us to protect ourselves and to be safe so everybody goes home at the end of the day. I want to go back to back to school here, back to the academy. So if somebody has to is looking to become a firefighter, thinking about becoming a firefighter, do they have to have, go to a certain school? Is it just the fire academy? How do they go about applying? Do they have to be in uh, some kind of physical shape? Yeah, there's, a, there's standards that we have that the fire academy sets up, and if you go to your local fire company, they can show you what you have to do and the, your requirements that you have to do as far as being uh, age, your physical statue, and also the time. The firefighter school is about just under 300 hours right now to, to get done, and once you get your cert, then you're a certified firefighter in New Jersey. How long does that go? Is that over the course of a, a few months? or? Yeah, our training center here runs two classes, a uh, fall class and a spring class, and it normally goes from September to December, so about four months different days here and there, Mondays, Fridays, and hands-on stuff on Saturdays. How many members do you have in your department, and what is your knowledge of some of the other volunteer fire departments around here about how big of a force is in Tom's River? For Tom's River, we're just about 300 firefighters for the six stations, and my station has about 45 active members. We have a lot of members that are non-active, that are there for support, for fundraising, for making sure the trucks are kept up, and uh, our older members that have become life members are still there to, to keep the younger guys in line. What is something about being a firefighter that you think that many people in the community may not know about uh, what it is you have to do to train, what it is you have to do to put out fires, uh, other parts of being about uh, being a firefighter? I think especially around here for Tom's River and surrounding towns, we're volunteer and people don't realize that the fire department's not a career fire department. Everybody has jobs, everybody has families, and when the alarm goes off, you're, you're stopping what you're doing, and then you're coming here to demand the fire trucks and go to the call. Everybody just assumes that it's like a police department or an ambulance where it's a career, but it's, it's all volunteers in Tom's River. How do you prepare as, as a volunteer to be ready at a moment's notice, whether it's in the middle of the night and you're sleeping, whether you're at your other job, whether you're just somewhere else entirely? Do you have to have certain things on you at all times to prepare for? Yeah, all our gear is kept at the firehouses and we're alerted from our dispatch center. But again, it's time and day. Everything dictates, you know, when the fire is. It could be in the morning, it could be in the afternoon, it could be night. Every fire is, is different time frame, so you have a different response by by time of day. So you never know who's going to show up. That's the part of being a volunteer fire department. How do you build that, that up over time of uh, get, trying to get used to not knowing when a, f when a fire is going to happen or when you're going to have to respond? Uh, is that something you build up over time to, so that you don't end up fatiguing? No, I don't think you can ever be 100% prepared. Even career or volunteer firemen, you never know when the alarm's going to go off. Now, this morning when we were coming up here, we had a fire alarm uh, dispatch that the two stations went to, so delayed our drill a little bit. So you, you always have to be mentally prepared and physically prepared, but when it's going to happen, you don't know. Uh, about being mentally prepared, emotionally prepared, what are, uh, how do you prepare for mentally, emotionally for some fires that cause a lot of damage to homes or businesses or, or in situations where lives are lost? Is is there even a way to prepare for something like that, or uh, and how do, how do, do you, firefighters kind of cope with something like that afterwards? I think that's a that's a bond that you get afterwards, and you can't prepare for it. And the person's worst day is when we're there. So when someone's house is burning down, a loved one is either injured in the fire or even if a pet dies, uh, now the fire department, we have to bond together as a group and the crew that was on the engine company to, to work with each other because you, you second-guess yourself saying, what else could I have done to make some the outcome different? And sometimes there is nothing. We did everything that we could do, and the outcome is still going to be a bad outcome. 
So there is a lot of people maintenance and there's a lot of um, mental stuff you have to do with post fire to be prepared for. It has nothing to do with actually firefighting. It has to do with the after effects of someone's house burning down or it's a family member or, or an animal. I'll, I'll close up on a happier note. Uh, what, is the, what are some of the, the exciting parts about being a firefighter even from your own experience or from talking with other firefighters? What are some of the, the joys or the, the exciting parts about being a firefighter? I think being a firefighter, career or volunteer, it's a second family. You, you're working together 24 hours a day. You, sometimes you fight with each other. Sometimes you're friends with each other. You party together. You go to gatherings together. You work together. So it's like a second family. And the job requires you to bond because what I do wrong affects you. What I do right affects you. So everybody has to work together. And it's a group effort to get the end, end result of putting a fire out and saving someone's life. Chief Sinan, thanks for the time. You're welcome. Have a great day. That's Chief Bob Sinan of the Silverton Volunteer Fire Company. I'm Vinny Abenu here at the Tom River Fire Training Center where we learned what it takes to be a firefighter.